Hi everyone and welcome to a special edition of Ask a Gardener with North Brooklyn Parks Alliance. My name is Leslie Velasquez. I work for Assemblymember Emily Gallagher. Um, prior to that, I did a lot of environmental justice organizing work um, in North Brooklyn. And that's what I'm here to talk about today is environmental justice. Um, so we're here in Marcy Park in Williamsburg. Um, and as I talk, we're gonna walk over to Rodney Park on the other side. Um, so first of all, you might be wondering, what is environmental justice? And environmental justice is just the idea that environmental harms and hazards should be equitably and fairly distributed, regardless of income or race. Um, and fortunately, that's not really the world that we live in. Um, most environmental hazards and harms are unfairly burdened upon people of color and low-income communities. Um, and you can call this environmental injustice or environmental racism if you're talking about race specifically. Um, environmental justice can also refer to a social movement that is for the equitable distribution of environmental harms and hazards. Um, and next, I want to talk about sort of why does this happen. Um, so it can really be sort of an indirect or indirect thing, but they're both due to discrimination. So indirectly, this might happen because let's say maybe a community is polluted, um, so it has lower property values. So marginalized people um, are just kind of forced to live there because they like make less money. And that's still the result of historic sort of systemic oppression, um, politically, socially, and economically. And it can also be um, direct, which is when people are literally prohibited from living in an area that is not polluted. This can be the result of redlining, which I'll talk about um, in a little bit, or housing discrimination, both of which have happened across the country, but very egregiously in New York City. Um, and also, uh, maybe intentionally, a source of pollution is literally placed in a community of color on purpose. Um, either way, if it's indirect or direct, this is not by accident. This is a result of the racist and capitalist system that we live in that discriminates against certain people and makes an inequitable distribution of resources. Um, and so next, I kind of want to talk about the history of North Brooklyn and why this is an environmental justice community and how it kind of came to be that way. Um, and as I'm talking, we're just gonna walk across the other side. Um, so North Brooklyn has this really strong history of being an area with a lot of industry and manufacturing. Um, and this happened all across the waterfront in North Brooklyn. Um, and it also has a history of being home to a lot of different immigrant populations. And they would come here to work in the factories. Um, they kind of like rotated different groups. Um, I think at first it was like Irish and then like Eastern European. Um, and then most recently we had a lot of Jewish immigration, which you can see in the Hasidic community of South Williamsburg um, and the Latinx immigration from Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico, also in Williamsburg and Bushwick um, and Polish immigration to Greenpoint. Um, and so because of this manufacturing, there's a long legacy of pollution from the manufacturing in North Brooklyn, all across North Brooklyn. And there's some still a lot of industry today that's still active. Um, and because of this history also too, of having a lot of immigrant populations, this really solidified North Brooklyn as having, you know, a really like working class um, identity, which made it unfortunately very prime for exploitation and environmental racism and discrimination. Um, and so here, I just want to pause before we cross over um, and talk about um, in the 1930s, the government process of redlining, which I, I mentioned a little bit ago. Um, but redlining was literally when like city uh, agencies would take a map of a neighborhood or the city and they would outline areas in red that were deemed undesirable or to, to say, oh, the property is not worth as much in this area. And mostly that was immigrant communities and communities of color. Um, and so a lot of North Brooklyn, I would say the vast majority was redlined, unfortunately. Um, and this, you know, made poverty and inequity it's so much worse because if you own property in that area, it was now pretty much worth nothing. Um, it also prevented people in those neighborhoods from leaving because they couldn't, they were not, they were discriminated against in terms of getting home loans to live in a different neighborhood. Um, and that, along with like white flight, which happened in the 50s and 60s, which was when affluent white communities started leaving cities in droves and moving to the suburbs, really increased government disinvestment in North Brooklyn and communities across the city. Um, and then in the 50s, too, we had the construction of the BQE, which we are standing over right now. And the BQE was designed by Robert Moses, who was a really notorious um, 
policy official slash pseudo urban planner in New York City. Um, and he's really notorious for creating infrastructure in communities of color that was polluting or, community, or creating infrastructure that would directly, um, in a lot of functional ways, discriminate against people of color. Um, and so when they constructed the BQE, this, like I said before, was an immigrant community, a community of color. And they um, it's tore the community in half. A lot of people were displaced because they needed so much land to build this highway. Um, and it, this highway brings in tens of thousands of trucks every day to the industry that I mentioned before. So it is a huge source of air pollution. In addition to noise pollution, um, you can see <laughs> just how loud it is here and how many trucks there are. And it's the middle of the day, not even community yet, commuting hours. Um, and so a, a lot of also parks in North Brooklyn, like Marcy Park, what we were just in, and Rodney Park, which we're walking to, are kind of just like leftover areas like from the BQE. Um, and there's parks like this all over New York City, you might start noticing them. Um, they weren't really like intentionally designed to be like nice places for people to hang out. You know, they were kind of just like, oh, there's this leftover land here, I guess we'll make it a park. Um, and that's also particularly dangerous because you know, you're inviting people to recreate and be outside in theoretically some of those polluted areas in this community. Um, and then so after the construction of the BQE in the 80s and 90s with globalization, a lot of the factories in North Brooklyn started shutting down. And so, you know, those jobs that people would work, that immigrants would work, um, were lost. And so poverty really increased dramatically during that time, along with the government disinvestment that I talked about earlier made North Brooklyn a very impoverished area. Um, and also during that time, fortunately though, there was a lot of amazing community organizations like El Puente, North Brooklyn Neighbors, that were doing a lot of um, really important environmental justice organizing. Um, and so through the 90s, the late 90s, and through the 2000s to today, we kind of have the era of gentrification of North Brooklyn. And so I think a lot of people, you know, see Williamsburg, Greenpoint, and they see how like nice and shiny it is and how much development there is and think, how could this area be an environmental justice community? But um, I just wanted to point out that I think that the, the decades of hardship economically, socially, politically, and environmentally are, that have came before gentrification are so much longer. Um, and even if there aren't like as many factories today, they still have that long legacy of pollution in the soil and in the water. Um, and gentrification in a lot of ways has increased environmental injustice because it has increased inequity. Like people who were here before gentrification, they are forced to live in areas that are even more polluted because they're being priced out of their homes. They might have to live closer to the BQE. Um, they might have to live in another community that is even more polluted than North Brooklyn. Um, and all of this to say that this North Brooklyn, regardless of gentrification, has endured a great amount of hardship um, and is still quite polluted. Um, and so now I'm going to just kind of talk about the risks of North pollution or <laughs> pollution in North Brooklyn. Um, so one of the most serious risks is air pollution. As I mentioned, the BQE is a major source of air pollution in this community because of the trucks that are coming from there all the time. Um, we also have, like I said before, still quite a bit of industry in North Brooklyn. So trucks need to come to and from those industrial areas pretty much every day transporting materials, things like that. There's also a lot of waste transfer stations in North Brooklyn. Actually, 40% of the city's waste transfer stations are in North Brooklyn. And those are carting garbage every day as well. Um, and also the trucks on the BQE and the trucks to factories, they're even more polluting than a normal car because, you know, they're so big and heavy. Um, in addition, for, in terms of air quality, we have um, the Williamsburg Bridge, we have a bus depot, um, and, and as well as a peaker power plant by the waterfront, which is extremely polluting. Um, another environmental risk is high heat from the urban heat island effect, which just means that, you know, because of roads and buildings, the way that they're constructed, they absorb a ton of heat and they hold on to it and they make it really hot. So cities are much hotter than rural areas. Um, and that, that's very dangerous. Uh, hundreds of people die from, from heat uh, stroke in New York City every year. Um, we also have a lot of soil pollution, as I mentioned before, because of the industrial history of North Brooklyn. All of, all of the sort of toxic pollutants in the soil from industry are still in the ground to this day, even with remediation in a lot of areas. There's still like brownfields, uh, which are just 
EPA Superfund sites that were polluted but have been fixed or remediated, but they, they're still like toxic in some minor ways. Um, we also have a lot of water pollution from the Greenpoint oil spill, as well as uh, manufacturing that was on the waterfront. Um, and along with that, there's a lot of flood risks in this community because we have the East River um, to the west and then Newtown Creek to the north. Um, so with climate change, with you know increasing storms, sea level rise, um, there's a much higher risk of flooding. And when there is flooding in a toxic community like this, you're basically lifting all of the toxins from the water and the soil and spreading them out everywhere in the community. So that's quite dangerous. Oh, and I want to mention from um, air pollution perspective, asthma rates in this community because of that are like abnormally high, um, as well as the incidence, incidences of respiratory disease. Um, and so all these risks that I mentioned, high heat, flood risk, soil pollution, air pollution, are all exacerbated by the lack of open space in this community. North Brooklyn, um, especially South Williamsburg and Bushwick, has some of the lowest open space per capita across the city. Um, and especially, as you can see here, like a lot of the open spaces that are in Williamsburg um, and just North Brooklyn in general, they have very little greenery. Like it's mostly concrete on the ground not a lot of grass or permeable surface, um, which increases flood risk, as I mentioned before, and makes it hotter. Um, and they are like directly adjacent to the BQE. So again, like I said, you're inviting people to be outside where it is extremely polluted. Um, and yeah, so why, why are open spaces um, so important? Um, like I mentioned before, they exacerbate all the other environmental justice or environmental issues that I talked about. Um, so when you have trees and greeny, greenery that helps improve air quality because they're taking toxins out of the air and releasing clean oxygen, um, they also reduce heat risk because they have shade, they release moisture, it makes it feel cooler. Um, and they reduce flood risk, as I mentioned before, when you have permeable surfaces, the dirt can absorb water um, and make it less likely to flood. And there's also tons of social benefits to green infrastructure and parks. Um, one is food insecurity. A lot of urban communities don't have access to fresh fruits and vegetables. So you could build community gardens and have, you know, locally sourced fresh fruits and vegetables. There's a lot of quality of life issues like recreation, um, also just health benefits. There's been multiple studies shown that like being outside, <laughs> being in nature is really good for your mental development, helps you get exercise. Um, and also it's just a really great space to like be in community with people. Like there's not that many spaces now anymore where you can just be outside existing with each other without having to spend money. So that's so important. Um, and it's a really important site for educational opportunities, in my opinion. Um, I think that, you know, a lot of kids growing up in cities don't have access to nature, so they don't feel connected to the earth. They don't feel connected to environmental issues. But if they're, you know, in nature, in community, getting their hands in the dirt in a garden like I think they can really start to understand like they are part of the earth and they do they're a part of the environment and they're impacted by environmental environmental issues um, for me I had a really amazing environmental education as a kid which is why I do what I do today um, and I just think that's so valuable um, so next uh, I want to talk about what you can do to support open spaces in our community um, you can get plugged into North Brooklyn Parks Alliance, as well as the other organizations doing really amazing environmental justice work like El Puente and North Brooklyn Neighbors. They are both working a lot on air quality right now, so I really suggest you check out their campaigns. You can also reach out to your local electeds like us, Emily Gallagher's office, um, and you know advocate for funding for parks. The parks department has been severely cut in its budget, so it's really important to do that. Um, and you know just get organized with your friends organize with people in your neighborhood um and yeah i, th I think that's it i i want to say um follow north Brooklyn parks alliance follow emily assembly on instagram and yeah have a great day thanks <laughs>